Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Fraser Nyman, Director of Archaeology here at Monticello, and I'd like to welcome you all to our archaeology live stream. Uh, this live stream is actually in honor of Virginia Archaeology Month, which is just coming to a close. Archaeology Month in Virginia is October. I'm here with three of my colleagues from the department, uh, and our goal today is to uh, share with you uh, some of the ongoing research uh, and collaboration uh, that we've been uh, undertaking over the last year or so here at Monticello. Um, uh, our, what we're going to do is offer three short lightning talks, about 10 minutes each, uh, and then uh, we're going to take questions and discussion uh, afterwards. So um, be thinking about what you'd like to ask us as we go along, and, and we'll be happy to engage. Um, uh, our presentations today cover both uh, wings of the department. That is, uh, on one hand, uh, uh, the Monticello, our, our Monticello Archaeological Research Program, which is uh, devoted to trying to uh, uh, discover all the archaeological sites on the uh, 2,500 acres of land that the foundation currently owns, and to try to tell the story of uh, settlement uh, and the evolution of uh, economic and uh, social uh, uh, patterns on that tract of land, really from uh, from before uh, European contact uh, through Jefferson's period of ownership and into the present. The second wing of the department is the uh, Digital Archaeological Archive of Comparative Slavery, or DAX, which is our, uh, our attempt, among other things, to try to uh, catalyze the uh, collaborative uh, comparative study of uh, the evolution of early modern slave societies, not only here at Monticello and the Chesapeake region, but throughout uh, the North American South and into the Caribbean. And you'll hear more about DAX uh, in a little bit. So my three colleagues who are gonna be presenting today are uh, Crystal O'Connor, who is our field research manager. Uh, she runs all our field work here at Monticello and Crystal is gonna be talking uh, about uh, our recent work at a site called Site 30, uh, a a slave quarter site occupied in the 1770s and 80s. Uh, then we're going to hear from Derek Wheeler, uh, who's going to update you on some very cool uh, developments in our understanding of the vanished plantation landscape uh, based on a newly acquired LIDAR data set, uh, which is giving us some new uh, insights into landscape details that, we've, that have previously been invisible. And finally, uh, Gillian Galley, who is the uh, director of DAX, the Digital Archaeological Archive of Comparative Slavery, is going to talk about a, a recent uh, intensive four-week four uh, uh, training program that we have uh, ran uh, here at Monticello uh, called the DAX Summer Institute, uh, which was uh, our attempt to uh, uh, empower uh, many of our DAX collaborators across the country and in the Caribbean uh, to contribute their own data to the uh, to the internet-based DAX archive. So that's enough for me, and I think it's past time now to turn it over to Crystal. Thank you. Thanks, Fraser. So we're going to go ahead and get started uh, with this live stream by talking about Site 30. So this past summer, Montreal archaeologists um, had the opportunity to start excavating Site 30. This is we call it Site 30. It's simply the 30th site that we discovered using plantation survey a decades-long research initiative to try to find, identify, and track um, and sleep, where enslaved people were living on the plantation, find evidence of Native American occupation, and also post jefferson occupation on the landscape. Um, so we took about 10 field school students out. They came to us from all of the country. We teach them how to do archaeology. This is where they learn how to do So we always structure our research using very specific research questions. We don't just go out and dig um, wherever we want. Um, we uh, 
for, for this summer, uh, our goals were, you can see them on the screen, to increase our sample size. We've never dug large scale excavations on site 30, so we needed to recover more artifacts. Uh, recover larger samples of artifacts uh, that allow us to date the occupation with greater confidence. So when does that site when does the site date to? We can say now pretty confidently that the site dates from the 1770s to 80s. Um, our, another goal was to explore spatial patterning and the size and density of artifacts across the site that can tell us about the length of occupations, how long were people living there, and and uh, how many households there actually were. Um, Third was to find patterns, to find these houses and where they were located, and to identify features like some poor pits and to see how many they actually had. Um, we um, had a couple of other goals too, and we'll probably get into more of those during the next couple of seasons of field work. But um, finding these cabins, finding these sites through artifact concentrations and features like some poor pits were our main goals. Okay, next slide. So Jefferson owned Monticello. Um, it's a 5,000 acre, initially a tobacco plantation, eventually transitioned to wheat as the main crop. Um, and Site 30 was, on, was situated on the Monticello home farm quarter. Um, and you can see uh, Derek made this map. Uh, Jefferson holdings are out in the red. Monticello quarter farm is sort of in the, the central portion of the site. And site 30 is located here. Next slide. We were looking for evidence of artifact concentrations to indicate where these cabins might have been located. So cabins that were located off of the mountain top um, were uh, uh, included sill-laid architecture. So that means that these cabins didn't have foundations. They didn't have stone, stone foundations, they weren't post and ground structures. The bottom sill or lobby of each cabin was put right on top of the ground. You can see in this slide uh, a photo of reconstructed building T, which was once home to John enslaved uh, joiner John Hammonds and his wife Priscilla. Um, so at site 30, we didn't know if we were looking for a smaller cabin like this, which might indicate family based housing, or larger cabins such as barrack style, style housing, which is a little bit more typical um, of, of architecture that we see in the tobacco period, so that earlier agricultural period here in Montreal. Next slide. Historical archaeologists have the advantage of looking through the documentary record, so we did that. Um, we have uh, a lot of documents that Jefferson drew and recorded notes on um, and, and wrote um, you know, letters. So we looked at his plaques here to see if we might find evidence of where, uh, where Site 30 was located and perhaps who was living there. Um, we don't have very many. We have several plaques from the early period when Site 30 was occupied. You can see here a plaque from around uh, the late 1770s, and we've marked uh, what, what Jefferson is showing here. The main house, of course, is sort of in the middle of that oval. Um, he's marking some orchards on the north side. He's marking the location of a park on the south side, so south is down. We've circled the location of, Bar of Site 30. And there's no building or cabin or structure that he's looking that he's indicated on this plaque. So in this case, plaques don't help us, maps don't help us, the documentary record, record doesn't help us um, find where the site is located. Next slide. We're also interested in um, learning more about the people who may have lived here. At site three, we don't know the names of, of people who lived here who were enslaved. Um, we we have a list of possible names, though. So Jefferson recorded in 1774, and then again in 1783, um, lists or roles of people that he enslaved. And he lists which quarter farm they are living on, um, but he doesn't indicate exactly where in the fields they're living. So we can sort of eliminate some of the names. We know some people who are living on Mulberry Row or on other outlying quarter farms. Um, in this case, we're going to need to do a little bit more work to narrow down the list um, of people who may have been living at Site 30. So let's think about Site 30 sort of in a broader context. Um, how does it fit into what's going on um, in Jefferson's shifting agricultural strategies? Who's living nearby? Um, let's zoom out from the site a little bit. So Site 30 is sort of in the left center of um, this slide. It's um, indicated by, by a blue circle. Uh, this is the Monticello quarter farm, the home farm that you're seeing right now. Um, all the little black dots that you see are shovel test pits. 
Uh, 16,000 of them here in the Monticello uh, quarter farm. So two decades worth of work, and we're finally just about finished with uh, with this piece of the property and finding um, sites associated with slavery. So uh, site 30 is an early site, it's a tobacco period site. Other early tobacco period sites include one, seven, and eight. And um, the overseer that is managing uh, the, the earlier tobacco period is living at site seven. From that location, he can see site 30, he can see site eight, he can see site one. So there's, there's surveillance going on. Everybody's doing the same task during the tobacco period. Uh, when, the, when Jefferson switches the main crop from tobacco to wheat in the 1780s, you can see um, how the red dots now spread out across the landscape and, and Jefferson spreads people out further, um, shifts the housing arrangement to more family-based housing, and, um, and, uh, and, and switches to, um, to smaller cabins as well. Um, so that's to give the site a little bit of context and start to think about starting it gives us an opportunity to start thinking about what we might find at site 30. Slide. So in 2005, we did our shovel test pit survey. Um, we dug uh, the shovel test pits on 40 foot centers and shrunk the interval down to 20 foot centers um, once we started finding positive uh, shovel tests. Uh, so artifacts included ceramics, white salt by stoneware, creamware, um, we found rot nails, we found, which are good indicators of, of a building or a structure, um, they would have called roof on, and then wine bottle glass. Um, so we came back this past summer with field school students, slide. Um, and to date have done 47 five foot by five foot test squares. Uh, our field crew is out there today, in fact, um, our field crew about that today, in fact, working um, and, and finding more artifacts. Slide. Uh, just some photos of some of the field work. You can see how red our clay is. Um, some of the students and some of the field crew working. Slide. Um, so the what our methodology here is to use a stratified random sample to get a very even, unbiased first pass, an initial pass across the site. So the blue lines um, on the bigger the bigger blue lines indicate 20 foot grid blocks. During our first pass this past summer, we chose one random five foot by five foot test square to excavate within that larger 20 foot grid block. And in doing so, um, slide, we've recovered um, over 7,000 artifacts from this site. You can see this distribution map shows us some of the concentrations. So there's uh, of, our, of those artifacts. So there's uh, darker red spots sort of in the center. There's a smaller one off to the east, and then sort of a, um, a spread of artifacts out from, from that center portion. Slide. The archaeologists are interested in, um, in uh, stratigraphy, which is how, uh, how dirt, how soil is deposited, and how it's formed. So out of the site, you know that it's a plowing site, this area wouldn't have had any trees in it, even though it's now the woods. Um, we have a, a it wouldn't have had any trees in it in the late 18th century, early 19th century, up until plowing stopped um, at the end of the 19th century. So we have a thin layer of egg horizon, which is forest floor. We have a plowing layer, which is where most of those artifacts are located that we're finding. And then we have a, a thin transition to subsoil layer. So the clay increases as you go down through that soil profile. Slide. Quick look at some distribution maps. Once we uh, screen all of our artifacts, we take all of them into the lab. Our lab analysts help to process these artifacts and then catalog them into DACs, our online cataloging system. In doing so, you can see that um, where our total ceramics are located, uh, where our rock nails are located, so sort of two discrete blobs, and then where our brick fragments are located. And brick is a pretty good indicator for us of where um, where a cabin is located, so maybe where a hearth is, um, would have stood. Um, so like I mentioned before, we found over um, 7,000 artifacts, almost 300 pieces of ceramic. So these at one time would have been bowls, dishes, um, mugs, cups. Uh, so evidence of domestic occupation. And we have here some of the wear types. Um, so what types of ceramic are we finding? Ceramic, archaeologists love ceramics, they're really diagnostic and we can really date sites by using ceramics. So ceramics are archaeologists' friends. 
Um, you can tell that the site is heavily dominated by creamware. It accounts for just about 70% of the assemblage. So using creamware and other wear types, we can pretty confidently put this site in the 1770s, 1780s. We also have a very small Native American component to this site, um, which is really exciting for us. So we have evidence of tool production, um, we have uh, pottery, we have cord mark pottery, we have pottery with um, small circular plate marks, we have projectile points. So this is a site um, that's on a flat uh, sort of terrace above a spring, so about the water source. Um, as Derek always likes to say, it was a good place to build a house now, it would have been a good place to you know, have occupation and to, um, for people to be hanging out um, for millennia. So we have um, evidence of millennia's worth of, of intermittent occupation by um, Native Americans, including a late woodland component um, with uh, pottery, that's Albemarle series, um, and these, would have, these artifacts would have been associated, these later artifacts, the woodland period artifacts, would have been associated with the Monacans who, who lived here, and who are they're still present on the landscape today. But, so the last exciting thing that we found that we're still um, downloading the photos from, this is very recent, uh, but we have evidence of a subfloor pit. So if you can kind of cross your eyes and make sure the sun is in the right spot, you can sort of make out the outline of one of these pit features. And we have it outlined in the next slide um, here in yellow. So this pit measures four feet by five feet, and this is a hole that enslaved people would have dug inside of their cabin and put uh, boards on top of it. And so people would have put things like vegetables, uh, root crops into this, um, into this hole, into this pit, and, um, and also personal possessions. So, uh, slide. And here's Lizzie excavating it, and we have one more. And here's the outline of it. Um, so this is a pretty big pit for a site um, in this time period. Uh, so, so we're wondering if there are other subfloor pits in the area. Um, we, we finished completion of, we finished excavation of half of the pit last week. So we're not going to excavate this in completely. Um, we always leave sort of a portion of it for future archaeologists who have research questions, different methodology, and come back in 20 years and excavate more of it. Uh, this pit measures almost a foot and a half deep. So this would have been a big cellar, essentially, where people could have put things like root vegetables and personal possessions. Um, and it, it really marks the spot of one of these cabins. So further research questions for next summer include, um, are there more of these pits at this site? Did, what sizes do they measure? What are their contents? This pit is now filled in. So once we um, it would have filled in post occupation, would have been filled in post occupation and abandonment of the site. Um, are there other sites that we can, are there other pits that we can find nearby associated with this cabin? And if we think about those artifact distribution maps again, we, we're also wondering if there are other cabins on the site. Seems like there's a couple of small pockets of concentrations, and uh, we really just have to do continue excavations to learn more about um, some of the anomalies that we're seeing um, and the differences in the distribution map. So, um, we have another couple of weeks worth of work worth at the site. Uh, you can follow us on social media to find out more as we finish this uh, this project for this season. We'll be continuing artifact analysis in the lab throughout the winter, so it's a very important component to any research that we do. So we look forward to showing those findings and sharing those findings with you over the next couple of months. And now um, we'll pass it over to Derek Wheeler. All right, great, thank you. Um, it's great to be here again. And today, if we go forward two slides, uh, as Fraser mentioned at the beginning, I'm going to talk about uh, the landscape history of Monticello and using a new data source of, of LIDAR. But first, let's uh, step back and see what data sources we use to try to figure out thousands of years of landscape history here at Monticello. If we look at the next slide, the first bits of evidence that we do have includes Jefferson era maps. As Crystal mentioned, Jefferson produced dozens and dozens of maps, uh, many of them at Monticello, of Monticello Mountain, which uh, this image is a map of the mountaintop, part of the ornamental farm around the mansion house. And, uh, and uh, we, it shows a number of the roads going around the house, which many of them still exist today. We have this photo on the right, uh, part of this road system. 
So most of the roads that still exist today are ones that are still useful to the to the inhabitants of the of the mountain, meaning today mostly staff that works at the Thomas Jefferson Foundation. All right, next slide. We see Jefferson also made slides of the agricultural fields. And this one is particularly important because this one was put together from a number of surveys Jefferson conducted in the 1790s. And it shows uh, what the cleared land looked like uh, during the transition from tobacco, uh, uh, raising tobacco as a cash crop and moving to wheat. So this is what Jefferson had to work with to uh, delineate into um, set permanent agricultural fields. So we can we have that's one data set. Another data set is uh, our, our D, is deed work, deed research. If we look at the next slide, um, here is a map that was produced almost 100 years ago when the foundation came into existence, and it was a map to uh, make it what did the land look like shortly after Thomas Jefferson's death in 1826. This is what the land holdings looked like in the early 1830s. And we see in, that Monticello Mountain is no longer owned by a single individual. The mountain top is, uh, is owned by uh, Jefferson Monroe Levy. However, there are other land owners as well. And so instead of just one person dictating to his enslaved workforce what was happening on the mountain, we now have many different owners. With, uh, so we probably will see as a result uh, different uh, land use strategies on, on the mountaintop. If we look at the next slide, a third bit, of, uh, third bit of information we have is aerial photos from the past. This is a great image from the 1930s, and it shows, shows some of this differing land use uh, on the mountain. We have areas of mature forest, which is kind of that stippled gray and white area, uh, as well as areas that were recently abandoned agricultural fields. These are where the areas where you have the darker, it looks darker in the image, and these are uh, pine trees and cedar trees are starting to grow up in these old abandoned fields, as well as uh, areas that were just almost abandoned just prior to when this photo was taken in particular right in the center where I have uh, marked out recently abandoned field. And then the, the light gray areas are still open fields as, as of when the photo was taken. Other images, other items were uh, useful for our landscape history here, roads, old orchards, et cetera. But, uh, um, but if we look at the next slide, probably one of the best bits of information that we had starting in the late 90s was a two-foot topographic map that was produced from aerial photographs. And in this digital topographic map could become the base map, did become the base map for combining all these different data sources and displaying them on in a single place. So that if we look at the next image, here is, for example, is what uh, Jefferson's plantation looked like around 1810 or the early 18 teens, uh, we have, were able to uh, place his road system on, on the mountaintop, his agricultural fields. Uh, uh, and, but the thing that, probably the important bit to take out of this is that this map was produced from Jefferson's work from the 1790s to about 1805, 1807. So this is kind of a decade long snapshot of what the plantation looked like. It may not have been what it looked like 10, 20 years later during his death, which at his death, which uh, we'll get into in a second if we get to the next slide. Uh, so finally, LIDAR, uh, the title of my talk. Uh, so in 2022, we had a LIDAR study um, conducted here. And here, LIDAR is similar to radar in that instead of radio waves being sent out to detect how, th how far away things are, you, you use light, light pulses uh, um, that uh, uh, determines distance. And as a plane flies over, it sends out millions and millions of these light pulses to the ground. And we have here what is called an intensity uh, map. And this is of Monticello Mountain, the mountaintop. And you might be able to discern the house in the center, uh, the mansion house in the center of the image. And, the, and when it's bright, that means the the laser pulse was reflected back to the plane and the sensor very strongly and the darker areas is uh, the signal is less strongly reflected. 
here the, the darker areas are trees and the, and the bright areas are the flat open grasslands. All right, so what can we do with this data? Uh, let's look at the next slide. First, step back just a step and going back to that 1997 uh, topographic map that we had, we can produce what is called a hillshade map. And this gives you a good visual representation of what the ground surface looked like. And looking at this data back, back when this was produced, it was, it was, uh, it was revolutionary. It provided much insight uh, to the landscape history. Uh, there's areas that uh, when we were doing our shovel test pit survey, we would also map fence lines and gullies and roads. But here we, we almost could abandon mapping these gullies because they're well, so well shown here. And, but let's zoom in on the eastern flanks of Monticello Mountain on the next slide. And this gives you some, uh, some of the things we're able to discern from this topographic map. We have existing roads pop out really well. Uh, some road traces, uh, what may or may not be road traces, they, uh, we'd have to go out and field check and see if they were, as well as what, um, we, what I call berms, which are simple low mounds of earth in a long linear alignment. Uh, these berms are probably not much more than, than a foot high, and, and those would be very easily seen by us if we wanted the field check. However, with the LIDAR data, this new 2022 LIDAR data that we have, we see in the next slide, hopefully all of you at home can see much more detail. For me, it was like when I put on my glasses for the first time in the fourth grade and I could suddenly read the chalkboard again. Looking at this, I could suddenly see so many details that were not present in that other map. Uh, not only are uh, berms much more prominent, the roads much more prominent, but we also see new, many new features, including what uh, appear to be orchard rows. And these orchard rows are I still go out to this area uh, shown on this map and I still have a hard time seeing these orchard rows uh, because the features are so ephemeral. They're probably just four or five inches in height, but the LIDAR data is able to um, pick this up, pick up the minute variations in the topography and, and display them fairly readily. Uh, so once, so what do we do with this data set? And uh, the uh, one, question is what, where, how do these features that we now see, where do they originate? When did they originate? If we go to the next slide, here I'm portraying uh, two, uh, two items, the extent of the Jefferson Fields circa 1800, as also the property lines that we saw in that property map from the, as the property looked, as, as it was divided in the 1830s. And we see that many of these berm features follow these 1830s property lines. And they don't really, not as much to an uh, extent following the old Jefferson agricultural fields from the early 1800s. And so one of the questions, one might be able to, one might make this assumption that, well, all of these features, most of these most readily apparent features date to the 1830s and they, post-date Jefferson's lifetime. However, that is probably a false assumption. In fact, we do at least know some of them are um, date, date back to Jefferson's lifetime. So uh, the, the berm is kind of in the middle center towards the top that has an asterisk next to it. We did an excavation there um, almost 20 years ago now. And on the very Eastern end of that berm, and we uh, decisively showed that this berm construction was constructed during Jefferson's lifetime by enslaved field hands to protect a water source, a spring source, a water source for their, uh, for drinking water. Uh, so these berms, all of these berms are clearly shown on an 1830s map. It, what may be happening is that we're seeing the final evolution of the field system at Jefferson's Monticello and that these berms uh, then became easily identified features that became easily demarcated as property lines and then were ac accentuated uh, during the 19th century by um, people building fences along property lines, bushes growing up along fence lines, and then windblown soils getting caught uh, in these bushes and whatnot and dropping 
And so these features uh, get bigger and more uh, readily seen. However, uh, we go to the next slide. There are still Jefferson era features that uh, do come out and are seen that uh, were hidden. In this particular image, uh, we have this map uh, that Crystal showed earlier of, of the ornamental landscape around Monticello. And in particular, I want people to look at the little bend in uh, what a road that Jefferson depicts just to the right or to the east of the stable. Um, the dotted lines here are the roads and the dot dashes are fences, but there's a dotted line. It takes a kind of a U shape or maybe a, a check mark shape just to the right of the stable. This is from the late, uh, mid to late 18th century. And in the next image, we'll see that even in the early 19th century, we still have, we still have that dip in the road. And if we go out today um, and look at that intersection, at the, those, some of those roads, portions of those roads still exist, especially uh, right near the stable. But that road today is straight. And if we look at the next and final slide, we see in the black lines it's outlined, we see that the road just comes off the stable, which I don't have marked here. I should have marked, I'm sorry. It's to just to the left of the leftmost arrow. But more importantly, hopefully you can see a home, a slight, uh, uh, the old roadway depicted, and I have it, I have these arrows showing, pointing to where there's a slight depression in the modern landscape uh, and where the arrows are pointing up are places that we were never, never able to see by walking across the landscape. It's just, uh, once again, our archeology span lab is shown up as one of the buildings on this map. And I walked across that a dozen times this summer and I have a hard, hard time seeing this feature, but the LIDAR study is able to sh show it. Um, we have it um, about a quarter mile in length that we of a section, a section of this road we did not know about. On the right-hand side of this image where the arrows are pointing down instead of up, there was a road trace we were able to see there, but it disappeared as one got closer and closer to the house. So from that, this is one of hopefully the beginning of many discoveries that we will have uh, helping us to see the early late 18th and early 19th landscape, century landscapes here at Monticello. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. And I guess next up, we have Jillian. Hello. Uh, I am just going to put my slides up. There we go. OK. Um, well, uh, as Fraser said today, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about the Digital Archaeological Archive of Comparative Slavery and our Summer Institute in 2022. Um, but first, before I talk about the Summer Institute, I want to talk a little bit about DAX. I think there may be people in the audience who don't know what DAX is. Uh, it is a digital archive filled with data from uh, on millions of artifacts from sites of enslavement across North America and the Caribbean. DAX was founded by Fraser Nyman and the archaeology department uh, at Monticello in 2000, and it is the longest running digital archaeological archive in existence. DAX is funded by the Mellon Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, Monticello, and other granting agencies. DAX is also a publicly accessible website. So all the data we generate and create from sites of slavery across the early modern Atlantic world goes up online through DAX.org. And you can go visit it now if you'd like. Um, whoops. Getting these. So the database contains sites from uh, archaeological sites uh, 85 archaeological sites across, as you can see, North America and the Caribbean. Each one of these orange dots is a site that has data in the archive. There are over 4 million records in growing, and uh, in early 2023, we'll have a number of other sites being added. I expect by the end of 2023, we'll be well over 95 sites in DAX. Um, in terms of artifacts that you can uh, look at and objects that you can view, they range from you know everything that we would find on a site. This is an example of a Colonna ware jar from South Carolina. 
Afro-Caribbean ceramics from, uh, in this case, this is from Nevis. Uh, tools like this iron hoe blade from the Hermitage in Tennessee. Spindle whorls, which speak to locally produced um, uh, fabrics. This is found excavated from a site in Barbados. Uh, high style ceramics like this white salt glaze mug uh, excavated from Mount Vernon. Uh, slate pencils, again, from sites in Tennessee. Uh, here's a jeweled knee buckle from uh, a site in Jamaica. Uh, tobacco pipes, gaming discs, ceramic gaming discs. This is a, a doll, a frozen Charlotte doll. We had lots of toys are in the database. Um, again, tools of the trade, a thimble. This one particularly evocative with the phrase, though absent ever dear on it. Uh, and then just thousands and thousands of brick, glass, mortar, uh, nails, everything that you can imagine from archeological sites, they all get cataloged and put into the DAX database and put online. So in addition to being an archeological database, we are a deeply collaborative archive and the website and metadata that are in DAX uh, have been developed with the input of dozens of archeologists and historians working on enslavement across the US, Caribbean and the UK. Um, they helped us develop the system and today are integral to how uh, DAX works and the types of projects that go into DAX. So this is our scholarly um, network in 2022. Sort of DAX is the center hub, Monticello and DAX right here. And each one of these dots is an institution, a museum, a university that we collaborate with. So why is collaboration for DAX so important? Um, consensus on the terminology that we use to describe artifacts and archeological sites and what exactly we record about them is critical to create, creating usable standards that can be used by historical archeologists working on all types of sites in the historic era. Um, collaboration is also critical to support and expand comparative archeological study of enslavement. So what, what can we learn? What can we know about how enslaved people lived, worked, uh, survived in slave societies? And we wanna be able to do that collaboratively and in conversations with other scholars and with the public. Um, who uses DAX? Students, scholars, and the public who are interested in archeology, span material culture studies, and just generally, generally learning more about enslaved people in their lives from the archeological record. And I think the best part is that DAX is free to everyone, uh, free to use the data, free to use the website, and, and now more recently since 2014, free to use the large um, Postgres SQL database that drives DAX. So um, how do we get data into DAX? Just very quickly. First, when we started in 2000, um, really through 2014, all the collections, archeological collections from the sites in DAX would come to Monticello, to the DAX lab, where we would physically recatalog all those artifacts into the DAX database. Also, we would sometimes go to those collections. So here are shots of us working in Jamaica at the Jamaica National Heritage Trust and at the University of West Indies. Um, but at the same time, our colleagues were asking how could they use the database from Mount Vernon or Drayton Hall or Washington and Lee. Graduate students were coming to us. So um, in uh, actually just a, a quick slide that says we currently still do these sorts of collaborative projects where we go to sites to work with people or sites, uh, artifacts from sites come to us at Monticello. But starting in 2013 with uh, another major grant from the Mellon Foundation, we created what we call the DAX Research Consortium. And this was a move to make the DAX database accessible to scholars through the internet. Um, anyone now with a web browser who has come through uh, the DAX lab at Monticello for training can use the DAX database to enter in their data from the sites they're working on. Um, Here's a quick peek at the database infrastructure. You might have to squint to see it, but uh, again, you know, with the login uh, with an internet uh, 
you know, our archaeologists, our collaborators uh, enter data from Jamaica, from Barbados, from their sites in Virginia or Texas or California, wherever they live, they can log in and catalog their own artifacts. And this is really wonderful because it means we can just enter more sites and get more data out there um, publicly accessible. It's not just a small team at Monticello now doing this work. It's a whole network of scholars who can do this work. So um, in order to be able to use the DAX database, scholars need to train with us and pass a certain number of material culture tests. This ensures that the data that we provide through DAX is um, you know, being created by people who know their artifacts and um, understand what they're looking at. So uh, these are just some images of folks who've come to work with us in the past. Uh, and we also go and train people in their lab. So this is uh, Dr. Alicia Odawale's lab at the University of Tulsa. Pre-pandemic, we were able to go out and, and train folks there. We're headed to Suriname to do some training in February. We're uh, you know, working with the Florida Museum of Natural of natural history actively and training both there and, and at Monticello um, as well. So what is the DAX Summer Institute? Uh, in uh, 2018, thanks to a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, we got a three-year, um, we got funding for a three-year program to further expand uh, the DAX um, Research Consortium and the functionality of our database. And the capstone to that grant was to bring scholars to Monticello to work with the DAX lab for four weeks. Uh, it was a four week fellowship in which we trained 23 fellows and interns from across North America and the Caribbean on the DAX database and our standards. Um, and the goals, as Fraser noted earlier, was really to empower them to enter data um, their artifacts and field records from the sites that they're excavating um, into DAX to train their students how to do it and to help contribute to this larger open science project to study enslavement on a large scale. Um, I just wanna quickly now show you a whole bunch of images from uh, this wonderful summer program. And uh, you know, here's a, a, a shot of all of us together. Uh, we worked up at Monte Alto, for those of you who know Monticello. We were there for a month um, in that space. Everybody brought their collections. If they had collections, they mailed them to us in advance or brought them with them. And we were looking at, um, we were looking at objects and artifacts from sites in Montserrat, St. Croix, Jamaica, Domin the Dominican Republic. Haiti, French Guyana, Florida, Maryland, South Carolina, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Texas. Um, and you can see here, our fellows were from universities and museums and government organizations um, from around North America and the Caribbean. We all lived together in Airbnbs across Charlottesville so people could really get to know each other. Um, and we all worked together five days a week, sometimes six and seven days a week. Um, both looking at whole objects here, this is an example, sort of shot across our study collection to everybody working around big tables, to um, you know, working together to uh, identify and analyze individual artifacts. Um, so I'm just showing you some of these you know, active working shots um, here. This is Jean Housen, um, who's actually a re retired archeologist who now in her retirement is entering her dissertation site from Montserrat into DAX. This is Dr. Alexandra Jones of Archaeology and the Community in Washington, DC, who's working on sites in Goucher, um, at, at Goucher University um, in, in Maryland. And then this is Macy Clerk Clerkley, who just graduated from the University of Virginia, will be heading on to graduate school. Um, so lots of generations of scholars working together to learn from each other and to help, help teach. Um, the next generations as well. So um, I'm just going through here. We're using DAC standards. They're learning how uh, here to uh, look really closely at beads using and ceramics using things called derm lights. These are used by dermatologists to uh, you know look at moles, but we use them to look at cross sections of ceramics or cross sections of beads to help with identification. Um, here is Pauline Kuhlstad from the Dominican Republic and Liz Ibarola from the University of Texas and Kemi Louis, who is actually um, from Haiti and is at the pursuing his PhD at the University of Santa Cruz. 
um, currently. And, and Kemi was actually a student of ours, of DAX in 2011, as well as his colleague, Mark Joseph, um, were field school students uh, when we worked at the University of Virginia, uh, excuse me, University of West Indies uh, in 2011. And he's come back 11 years later to train with us on um, how to enter his dissertation site artifacts into DAX. So um, it was a really exciting dynamic time. Um, this is just sort of, I'm showing you pictures here of what it was like, um, folks learning how to sort different ceramic types and catalog. Um, Got a great look at uh, locally produced red clay pipes from Jamaica, as well as locally produced ceramics. This is Ryan Cousins, who's a senior artifact uh, officer at the Jamaica National Heritage Trust, showing us the rim of what's called a chimney in Jamaica, but what is really called, what we call a chamber pot. So this is a chimney, a chamber pot uh, made out of locally um, local ceramics in, uh, in Jamaica. Uh, Let's see. We took people on field trips. So we went to Winterthur, uh, Mount Vernon, Colonial Williamsburg, and Jamestown to look at their incredible collections and get lots of hands-on work with uh, whole vessels. Um, and, uh, you know, as the program wrapped up, everybody took material culture assessments. Uh, folks are in the process of getting materials into the database now, starting to catalog their own sites. Um, and we've got uh, a number of scholars who will be returning from DSI 2022 to work with us in 2023, uh, folks from Stanford and UCLA and the Estate Little Princess. We also have scholars who are going to be working with us in December who were at DSI coming back to um, continue to, to work with us on material culture identification and getting their sites in. Um, so we had lots of lectures uh, from material culture scholars as well as from each person uh, who was participating, got to lecture to us about their sites and talk to us about the work that they were doing. Um, and then I'm going to leave you, because I think we're coming up on two o'clock, with a link to a Vimeo video, which, um, I actually cannot play through StreamYard, but you can go watch a 10 minute video if you'd like on um, the on the DAX Summer Institute and uh, you know get a sense of the full range of the work that we were doing. Um, so anyways, quick snapshot of uh, DSI 2022, and we're looking forward to continuing programs like this in subsequent summers. Thank you. Okay, thanks, thanks, Jillian. Um, I think there might be a few questions, and um, yeah, there's a Mel, yes, Mel. I guess it's gonna. From behind the computer. Um, yes. Richard is asking how common it is to find creamware pottery around Monticello, and where it is most commonly found. I can take a stab at that question. Um, so Bridget's question was. Um, where do we most often find creamware and how often do we find it? And creamware is a type of ceramic that was mass produced in England between 1762 and 1820. Um, so it sort of, a, uh, sort of helps to kick off what archaeologists call the consumer revolution. Uh, so it's this mass purchase of goods, um, very accessible to a, a, a wide cross section of society, enslaved people who are enslaved on their sites. Um, three white workmen, Jefferson, the Jefferson family owned creamware. Um, so the, the, the quick answer is that we find it on, I'd say, most domestic sites at Monticello. Um, we have a lot of it at site 30. Um, interestingly, we have less of it overall than we do at other contemporary sites. Um, so that kind of uh, starts off a conversation of, of why. Why do we have less creamware at site 30 than other contemporary sites? Is it a different in access to resources? Is it a different in economic status with um, the enslaved people who live there? Is it do we have fewer artifacts there because it was a shorter occupation? Um, we're not sure, and I think that's where archaeology can can be really helpful in helping to understand those questions. And that's why DAX is really helpful too because we can really trust these standards, um, the rigorous standards and the rigorous catalog cataloging methodology that lab analysts employ when they catalog. We can trust the data and we're able to compare an assemblage from site 30 with um, later sites at Monticello, with sites in Tennessee, with sites in the Caribbean. So um, yeah, so 
so, so creamware, the creamware that we find at Site 30 tells us about you know, Site 30, but it also, when we zoom out, helps us think about and understand nuances in, in slavery in the, in the Atlantic world. So, do you all have anything to add? Thanks. That's good. We also have a question from David asking if trees should be removed to open up more digging pits, and should the Ravana be explored by divers? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I guess I'll uh, jump in on that. Um, yeah. So actually, we uh, we try to be uh, gentle with trees and only remove them when they really have to be removed. Um, I think yeah, trees are our friends and. Uh, if you've ever uh, spent a summer excavating in a in Virginia in a cornfield, you know why. Uh, yeah, I don't know, diving in the Rivanna. Um, I'm not sure that that's, I mean, yeah, it, potentially, but I think, you know, one of the issues there is just, there's so much sediment in that ri river. I mean, visibility is gonna be, uh, you know, maybe cent on centimeter scales. So it's, yeah, it would be a, very difficult to see to see what you're uh, see what you're up to, but I, I strongly suspect that there are sunken bateaus, you know, these long boats, shallow bottom boats that were used to float tobacco and later uh, wheat down to Richmond, and obviously consumer goods goods up up to Monticello and to Charlottesville. I'm sure there are sunken bateaus uh, hiding out there, waiting for some enterprising. Uh, uh, underwater archaeologists to discover them. So. There's one more question, which um, may be more for Jillian. Stephanie is asking, if you have to be connected to an active site to participate in DAX summer sessions. Did you hear me, Jillian? I did. Am I muted still? No. Oh, good. OK. <laughs> Um, do you have to be connected with, I would say, Stephanie, you should reach out and, and, and send me an email. So the, the answer is usually yes. We like people to have an active site they're working on and collections that they're working on um, when they come to train with us. It helps because they have their own artifacts and they can um, continue actively working on those artifacts once they leave us. That helps reinforce what they've learned um, during their time in the DAX lab. So the answer is yes, generally we like that, but I always love to hear about sites that people might be excavating that they want to put into DAX. Okay, thanks. Well, according to Mel, we're, we've run out of questions. Uh, so I just want to thank everyone for, for coming uh, to our live stream. Uh, this is actually the second of our Archaeology Month, month live streams. Uh, we did one of these last year, and I, we look forward to seeing you again next year for another three lightning talks on what we're up to. And in fact, I am sure that we will be doing live streams on other topics uh, as, as the year progresses. So um, look forward to seeing you then as well. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.